welcome to this afternoon's PTIC. Um, good to see uh, so many people here on a Friday afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, turning up. Um, we have apologies that I'm aware of from David Batchelor from Ticketer and Keith Sabin from Shropshire. I don't know whether we've got any more. Oh, yes, we should have Triumph. I was going to say, do we not have Triumph? But he's dropped out the last minute, hasn't he? Yeah. And, and volunteered me to present. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, hopefully you got copies of the uh, agenda and minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, Teresa. You, they came out before the agenda, which uh, <laughs> scared me into getting the agenda sorted out. <laughs> Normally it's the other way around between us. So, uh... It usually is, Tim. Yeah, I always have great hopes. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not of scaring you, but of getting them done sooner. <laughs> right. Minutes of the last meeting. Uh, so um, the bus open data service. Um, there was a uh, challenge around the title of complex fares, um, given that actually some of them aren't actually that complex. They're just difficult to model um, and uh, and whether it was the right message. So um, I don't know whether you've got anything, Stephen, in. Uh, nothing but a smile. Um, I mean, I understand where Peter's coming from, but... Um... You know, it, the statutory instrument calls them complex pairs, so there's a reason why they call it. I mean, it, it's not, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's a legacy of the NetX profile, and then that was written into the statutory instrument. So, I mean, we can rebrand it, um, but I'm not sure how you do that without losing its relationship to the, you know, the legal obligations that people have. Yeah. So yeah. I've, not, I've not heard anything from Triumph about that. No, no. OK, um, flexible services we will come on to in the agenda. Um, then um, I don't know whether we've got anybody from the Naptan team here. No. Um, so um, I know that um on the first one um on the naptan viewer tool um that uh, those discussions about um producing uh, compiled versions of it continue um i don't think anything has uh popped out from that yet um and um the business rules um i don't know whether um keith have you heard anything back from uh haraj about business rules not a dicky bird okay um and um there was another one that was um for you keith um you were gonna send stuff about Jersey and the Channel Islands and getting them set up uh, on Naptan. I forwarded the previous conversations I had with Sarah. That was only last week after I received the notes of the last meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the reminder. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. OK. Um, and um, on the uh, journey planner performance discussion um that's something that i need to um pick up um with uh, at co stroke uh, john uh to uh, actually get something set up um 
there have been some interesting conversations about journey planners and representations in, in various other groups over the last couple of months. So it does feel like there's a increased interest in understanding more about how they're presenting data and um, how uh, how we might uh, be able to uh, help people understand the way that particular planners work. Um, and um, on European standards, John asked a question about DFT ownership of standards development. Um, so um, conversations with the DFT, um, they are um, quite clear that for the standards that they need and are necessary for things that um, that they will continue to promote and uh, support the development of those. So things like Trans Exchange and NetEx and Siri um, within the constraints that they've got of the of the legislation and the programmes that they've got. Um, so um, they are behind them um, and uh, you know, for the first time for a good few years there's been some extended effort put in on their part to uh, with profiles and, and development of, a, of advice and, and support for them so uh, i think it's going in the right direction and um an open and ongoing action soon as i've not heard from um anybody um if there's things that you want ptic to be looking at and doing then please do let me or Teresa know and we can sort something out continuing uh request okay that then brings us on to the uh open data digital service which um I think probably is you, Stephen. Are you talking about all of it, apart from flexible so. services? Yeah, um, I will try my best. Of course, you know, I, I, like I said, I've been bought here at the last minute. I've been provided a presentation. I will, of course, talk through it as best I can. Um, but, you know, perhaps some, some of these things, Tim, you may be better, better place to, I guess, elaborate if there are any questions. Um, so, um, I'm assuming we can all see this. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I guess uh, sort of headline. Um, headline points about what's been delivered in the last three months and um, the phase validator um, was deployed. Well, I think it was initially deployed in March. There were a couple of issues with it, but I think it's been deployed fully early April. Um, and there's been a few iterative improvements of that, still a few to come. Um, I can talk about that a bit more in a bit. Um, matching timetables to AVL, so more reporting has been built in. I'm not sure why that's changed. Um, more reporting has been built in uh, to sort of match um, the, the vehicle journey codes and everything within timetables to AVL to give the better idea of um, the quality of the data. Um, and we've built in two new things, you know, there's the operator profile. So now, you know, there is a profile where operators can go. You can see an operator as an entity and see what services it has and that require attention and, you know, manage the seasonal services, you know, to make them exempt from certain reporting. Because, of course, you know, something that's only operating every now and again may be constantly registered, but may not actually have any live data for it because it's not operating. So there's an exemption process for that. And then a new feature which was released in the last couple of weeks, the LTA profile. So that's something that is now every local authority should be able to go into the bots um, service and view data in their area. Um, it's quite a basic thing at the moment. It'll just tell you, um, you know, what uh, what we think the OTC has registered in your area, and you know how much data and how much data compliant data has been published for that. Um, it will be improved iteratively go along to start to look at AVLs and all the rest of it and maybe integrate the disruptions data in the future. Um, in terms of the next three months, what we've got on the roadmap, um, more improvements to the data catalogue, you know, removing inactive data sets. 
the data file is quite useful, but of course, you know, making sure that it's um, taking a snapshot of the right thing is quite important. Uh, simplification for ABL compliance. I mean, maybe you can talk about that, Tim, a bit more. What the rules, simplification of the rules. Um, we're going to bring in flexible services to BODs. So you're working, Tim, on the extensions to Trans Exchange to account for flexible services. You know, once that's finalised, um, that's going to be built into BODs so that those services can pass all the compliance checks and appear in the reports as we want. And all the other sort of UI functions are adapted to take account of flexible services as well. Um, and then obviously, disruptions. Um, so we built a disruption service, which I might may demo for you later. Um, this is going to be a nationwide system that produces Sirius X, mainly maintained by LTAs, open to operators if, if the situation is right. Um, but integrating that that disruptions data onto Bolt as a fault data source, um, and then having an API so you can grab it, you know, initially in Sirius X, and um, maybe in the future as uh, GTFS RT as well. Um, before going any further, I think I'll just stop. That's quite a lot of information. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of that that I've just said? I've got a couple. Yeah. Um, you may not know the answer, but it'd be very useful to know what um, uh, the match timetable, matching timetable to AVL success rate is at the moment, both as a global figure and by some sort of geographic area, if, if, if that's possible, or by, by operator, if if not, that would be extremely useful. It would be extremely useful, Nick. Unfortunately, the statistics I've been pro provided don't, uh, don't cover that. But, you know, we can take that away as something definitely. Yeah, yeah. Around. yeah. I, I didn't expect an instant answer, but I think it, it is a useful thing to understand it because is, yeah. uh, everyone in this business is trying to uh, achieve that sweet spot. So how far you've got with something, there'll come a point when your methods and, and the data that you're able to ingest will be of high higher quality uh, and the other one um is uh understanding whether or not we could um have access to a test feed of in of disruptions because tickets are a bit distracted a bit busy and we're absolutely desperate to understand because as you may know a number of territories i mean <laughs> the the wonderful tracy braben has said that she will turn the whole service off if um if uh, too many ghost buses report in Yorkshire. So with a, with a gun to the head like that, it would be nice to know if we can actually start to see disruption feeds. Because I think tickets are testing it with Wiltshire and was it Essex and one other county. It'd be good, good to have access to that feed so that we can actually start to see what's available and, and whether or not we can use it. Yeah, I mean, there are multiple Sirius X feeds that are sort of emerging and they do very different things. You know, I think yes. from Ticketer and VIX were talking really about vehicle journeys um, and maybe their cancellation. For yeah. the disruption service that's been built by DFT, that's aimed at LTAs and it's slightly higher level. That's really affecting networks, operators, stops and services rather than as, as low down as a vehicle journey. Initially, it's going to be integrating the DFT on disruption service. Um, which will be the one maintained by LTAs. So that's not really about cancellation level events. Okay. Uh, it's it's higher level. Right. We will be looking at once the API is functional and available on BODs, we'll be looking to then how we can integrate the stuff that's coming from Vix and Ticketer to give a much more um, comprehensive nationwide view okay. of disruption to public transport. So, Fabulous. yeah, I mean, I can send you a, a link to the API for the disruption service that West Yorkshire will be producing the, you know, yeah. the authority themselves. Um, but we don't have direct access to the ticket or VIX fees at the moment. I have some snapshots, but I've got nothing. I've yeah. got no API access. OK. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is something that's in its early, it's in its infancy, but we want to kind of try and get ahead of it um, because, yeah, if we can get the state on board, so that's a massive. Thank you. That's really useful. Thank you. Mm. Um, any more questions? Uh about on numbers. on the LTA profile, which I think is a really positive move for for helping authorities understand what's going on with operators in their area, and a potentially uh, really useful one for working with small operators who might not be engaging um, as well as possible. Um, do we know what? 
promotion is going to be made about that because if people don't know about it, then they're not going to be using it. And it's whether... Yeah, it will very much be promoted. I think that at the moment there is a slight issue with it that um, if the service can't find any reference to your council and the OTC, your council order doesn't appear at the moment. That's quickly going to be rectified. But I think until that is rectified, it's probably best not to not to publicise it too widely because if you go on and search for your council, you can't find it. I think that's a bit of, a bit of a problem. So, for example, you know, if I go in inside in Cumbria, um, well, I can spell Cumbria properly. Um, it doesn't appear and um, whereas it should um or its replacement usually don't appear so that will be fixed very quickly but um yeah i think promotion of it is definitely something we're going to be doing i think there's workshops going on in july to sort of talk about this profile and all the tooling that's being made available disruptions and all the rest that's being made available to local authorities so there'll be a big push then i think to raise the profile of it but i think you know, it's baby steps at the moment. This is quite basic. What it's doing is really just seeing against the OTC what reg what's what registrations are there in your area. But that's a very imperfect way of doing things because the OTC API is not it's not very good um, because the obviously a lot of its conversions from paper registrations into data and that obviously brings issues. But yeah, some definitely something we're promoting and definitely something that's going to be iterated on considerably in the next few months. Um, to hopefully get all the local authorities a bit more engaged with bonds and you know a more collaborative approach to compliance from small operators perhaps with a bit of input from the LTAs. But yeah, it will be promoted, just give it a month, I think, to iron out the kinks. No, yeah, that's good. Anybody else for a press on? It doesn't know. Um, OK, so I'll just waffle through some stats about what's going on. So we have a table here, quite self-explanatory. Um, figures perhaps not looking as high as we might like, but there are quite a few issues around this. You know, uh, the business change team are constantly still working with all the operators and the small operators in particular to try and get them to publish data. Um, I think there's a couple of points here that are quite important that, you know, there's still conversations going on with OTC about the accuracy of the registrations. And that goes back to the point I made earlier about the API. The API. There are issues in the sort of the way that registrations are sorted and being maintained. So it's quite possible that these figures, these percentages will increase, not through um, any more people publishing data, but actually the expectation of who should be publishing data going down. Uh, so that's, that's quite an important discussion. Um, and then the generic one, ongoing discussions with technology suppliers, ensuring they're briefed, you know, making sure that we have regular catch ups with everybody that's relevant in terms of supporting operators publishing data. Um, any questions about that before I press on? That's a note. Um, and then just the graphs. I don't think I'm going to add much commentary. We've got trend lines. The trend lines are all going in the way we'd like to see them. Um, yeah, maybe not as fast as hopefully. We've got 80% as that kind of holy grail threshold um you know as like a, a target we're trying to attain a realistic side, uh, target um so you'll see it blocks to compliance the points we already know you know we've got issues and most of this is related to again things that are the way registrations are actually being stored um, and maintained is actually perhaps the real reason why we're not attaining the compliance that we might hope to achieve um mike sorry i can see you got your hand up Yeah, cheers, Stephen. Uh, sorry, it was real late. I haven't. It was just on the figures, the complaints for the timetables AVL unfair. It's just at the board session yesterday, there were figures of 80 and 90% were, were kind of put up on the board. I'm just wondering, if, is well, that because it is ahead of this or? Yeah, it's June now, so um, this is yeah, so, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. No uh, worries, man. I know, I know, yeah. I know you've, been, you've been called in last minute. So, yeah, we are yeah, at 80 yeah. and 90. I always say, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think, I think well, there has been progress in getting more people to publish, certainly. Um, so that's why the figures are constantly going up. Um, but yeah, these figures are obviously four weeks, maybe even six weeks out of date. Um, get, I wouldn't get too excited about the fares percentage, whether it's 70 or 80 percent, because most of the data does not contain all of the information that you want. Um, because true. there's we'll, still we'll, a tendency. We'll get onto the validator. Yeah. Um, you know, not to produce uh, full records. Yeah, well, uh, when this is talking about compliance, this is really just talking about which they've published not if they published fares in the way we want it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'll talk quickly about the validator in a second. 
Um, we had the API. I'm not sure if people can we'll share these slides afterwards. Um, API consumption, players API consumption not very high. Um, all the other ones showing nice big figures. The gap in November, we had outages, we had various problems with the API in November caused by the real time system. I mean, it shouldn't really have impacted the other ones, but it did. That'll be something that's addressed by Reactex and Bold slightly. Um, then top tie, top API consumers. I don't think we need to talk much about that. Um, unless anybody has any questions Just about it. Just an observation from me, Stephen. I'm glad to see because I I think the last set slide deck from last meeting was was quite kind of there was a lot of information on one slide and it's nice to see some more graphic representation of it. Um, so it was. Just I would, I would like to take the credit for that, but uh, it's not well, me that's done it. Um, no, but, okay, yeah, I mean, but it was just to be noted. Normally, it's questions or concerns, and I'm it's going in a better direction, which is nice to see. That was my yeah. I, th I think trying to kind of cobble this together from the reports that we generate internally by KPMG four DFT. So maybe that's why the the graphics and that are a bit more informative, perhaps. Um, but yeah, yes. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll we'll supply this to Tim afterwards, and you can put it out um, by BT. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you think this is something that you'd like more regular updates on, you know, figures and stats. I mean, I mean, he sure has been trying to Triumph has been providing the figures, but I'm just saying this is moving in a direction for me of being able to understand it a little bit easier um, than just the table cram full of numbers. That's yes, but I think the most important thing is that. Um, People who are involved in building bots have been stripped out of these stats because <laughs> they are invariably the biggest users and it can distort uh, the real story. But this is, you know, very much about um, companies that aren't DFT or KPMG or ITO, um, but people who actually consume the data and are building and testing it. Um, so yeah, that's the the roundup of the bots update. Um, I'll press on to the third advantage in a second, but I'll just take a break to see if anyone else has any other um, questions or things they'd like to shout about. Let them know. Okay. So I've got a first validator as well. So we know, you know, I've, I've knocked a few slides I was going to present before I was asked to do the main bobs thing. So I'm maybe sort of repeating myself slightly here. Um, but as you know, first data is, um, you know, very varying quality. Um, so we've introduced a validator, um, and this is something that happens. You know, when you when you publish a file, um, either whether you do it manually or it comes from you know uh, the ticket uh, portal, that data is unzipped and it's run through these rules to make sure that certain elements are present in all cases. Sometimes the relationships between different types of elements have to be a certain type of element. Um, you know, so for example, you can't put in 24 hours duration for a single trip ticket because, of course, single trip is defined as a, as a trip. It's not a, a temporal pass, those sorts of things. So just to quickly go through what, what we say, you know, I wrote this for the program board, hence why I've not updated the, uh, the bit at the bottom. But um, just a brief uh, exp exp explainer of what we've saw, the sort of things that we're trying to um, standardise. So, you know, the validator is expecting the product name for a service now to be in a defined location because anybody who's familiar with NetX is that there's a name field for every single thing. Um, so, you know, where you're actually storing the product name is quite important because you can put it in various places. Um, line ID, so talking about making sure that anything that relates to access to services or service um, describes that service in a way that's relatable back to the trans exchange data. So that's a bit like the, the timetables to AVL matching or timetables to um, NetX, um, first data, and we've got product type. This is obviously a big thing, and you know, most of these things are not matted. This is very different. NetX is a bit different to TransChains and that so much of it can just, it's just optional. So now we're making it mandatory for people to declare what product type there is. So that's fairly self-explanatory. User type again. So, you know, what we're finding is people will put in adult ticket just in the name. So that's a free text file, a free text name. That's impossible to sort of use in a programmatic sense. So, you know, making sure that the enumerations that are provided for in the standard are forced, you know, people are forced to provide them some sort of value. So there will always be a user type now attached to every product. Um, type of tariff, so showing the, the price and structure. So again, people can submit data without that. So now it's really describing um, what type of um, tariff structure there is. 
um, relating to the product. Um, and then continued conditions of use. So this is really, is it single trip? Is it round trip? This, this is really for returns, but will be expanded on for things like through trips. Um, although we're not really checking the through trips at the moment, but that'll be built on in the future. And then sales off the package. You know, we've probably heard that phrase before, how you pay for it, where you can buy it, how do you evidence your right to travel once you travel it, that sort of thing. Um, so all of these things are now mandatory um, in the data. Um, and when I say mandatory, you won't be blocked from publishing it. It's what we call soft block. But what we've got now is a situation where you get yourself on the right thing. Um, you can now go into the first data and every data set is described as either being compliant or non-compliant. Uh, so at the moment, the level of compliance is very low. Um, but my presentation, I do have a progress one later. Um, I'll skip straight to it. That some of the there are a couple of small issues with the VAR data at the moment, still relating to the fact that it doesn't account for carnage products properly. And there's a small issue with the composite frame types. Um, those need to be fixed. And um, once they are fixed, once tickets are updated their system, all all products that are simple products that are exported from a ticket system will be compliant with VAR data. So we should see the compliance go up enormously because obviously they're the biggest provider. The first data, VIX are progressing pretty well towards it as well. So Stagecoach, you know, I'd imagine they'll be compliant in the next month. And then obviously everything created by the CFDS is already compliant with our data rules. So when we go through and actually look for stuff that's compliant, that's basically files that have been produced by the CFDS in the last six, six to nine months. Um, so there is compliant data on there. The majority of it is non-compliant, but this is something that will be solved by the suppliers uh, and they're very close to solving it. So I think that by the next speed tick, what we should be seeing is maybe not 100% compliance, because obviously some legacy data will be there for a long time, but we'll see that figure jump massively and very quickly. Um, and I've also got a slide about the benefits of this validator. I think I've really just sort of already described that, you know, the elements show that all data that we need from a product is contained in the same file. Data is more easily under understood by anyone consuming it theoretically encouraging and greater use of it. We've built something in called the first data catalog. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but that essentially is now like the other data catalogs that you can essentially see a breakdown of all the first data that's uh, live on BOS now, and it'll tell you what product types there are, you know, what what passenger types there are, and you know whether it's even a multi-operator ticket or not. Um, so now you'll really be able to do analysis on what's, we'll be able to do a much better analysis of what's been published, have a fair better idea of what operators have published all their adult tickets or all the child tickets or all the period tickets and um, you know start to monitor what we expect to see from multi-operator tickets and whether we're seeing them so that first day catalog is going to be the basis for a lot of reporting going forward um but like i say it's early days the validator's not been there that long and people aren't necessarily always compliant but um i think it's an important step to really making the bringing some value to this first data there's a lot of it there it's very hard to use but i think we're you know, really sort of progressing towards it being a coherent data set that can be used in actual live products or for modeling or analysis purposes. Um, so yeah, that's my update on the first validator. Uh, I'll stop again in case anyone's got any questions on it. Sorry, just one question on the um, on the disruption uh, disruption feed you mentioned earlier with Sirius X. Would you be able to share the details of what would be possible to consume? Of course, yeah. I, well, I, I was actually, if, if there's time permitting, Tim, I was going to do a quick demo of the new disruption service in the API, um, if people are interested. I'll yeah, I think that might be. So, I can see affirmative. Yeah. Right. so Adrian, yeah, I'll just demo the service and then we'll talk about the API afterwards and then we can talk about getting people access to the UAT API. So you can see the sort of data structures that are being used. I mean, the data in it will be stuff that the LTAs have done while testing, so it may not be that coherent, but it'll give you an idea of what the data should be. Um, Jonathan and Nick, I think you both had questions. So Nick, you got your hand up. Um, yeah. Uh, could you uh, ask your policy colleagues whether or not they're already planning to or um, would be interested in pursuing this wonderful fairs data to see whether or not they can press for more rationalization of fares. Uh, there are almost more fares than buses uh, in terms of type, quantity, etc. And it's extremely confusing for customers. 
uh, I know there are steps being made and, you know, regions are pretty good at kind of uh, being able to kind of do a purchase a blanket fair deal, but more rationalization would be, uh, you know, very attractive in terms of making the service more rational, easier to acquire and uh, less punishing for the poor blooming customer. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I completely agree with that. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with the uh, the fair simplification is in we're in dire need of it. I think it might be a bit above my pay grade, um, but yeah, I mean, I think one thing it will do is this data and this data catalog that reflects it. It will allow us to express in a real sense, in a in a meaningful sense, based on data, how complex the fairs offer actually is, and how crazy it is that we've got thousands of potential fair offers. Um, I mean, I think. Obviously, the government have taken some action around fares, introducing this two pound cap. But again, it's it's sort of these interim extensions, creating cliff edges, and then we get another extension as another cliff edge. You know, I think obviously that does need to be addressed in the longer term. But you know, people are aware of that, and it was mentioned at a day we had yesterday with you know a bod's ignition day. I think Tim was there, and um, that that sort of approach to fares would have definitely mentioned. Um, but I think the bod's the work we're doing is really about bringing the evidence rather than changing policy. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. But it's, I think, yeah, it's definitely something that we can communicate back. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, did you have a question as well? Uh, yes. I just wanted to um, consider, I mean, the, the fares validator is, is brilliant. There's massive progress. And, um, you know, thank you very much for, for, for driving that. That will definitely help put up in lights, um, you know, the, the uh, quality of the data. However, if you just turn this around and look at it from the point of view of the non-compliant operator, um, what is going to happen to them if they publish non-compliant data? They have the embarrassment of a label showing non-compliant, but is the DVSA going to do any enforcement? Well, do, think, does think, anybody know? Because yeah. um, it, it's, it seems to me a little bit too easy you know, to, to sit there with non-compliant data and, and not do anything. Yes, I think um, I should have probably put another slide in called the future. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I think I've discussed previously that there will be a second iteration of our data later this year, Q, probably Q4, realistically, let's be honest. Um, and I think that once that is introduced and people are expected to comply to complex fares, because of the complex fares deadline was put back by a year to January 24, once that's in place, that's when we're going to start looking at hard block. Um, so you won't be able to publish non-compliant data. So I think the approach for now is, you know, for the next six months, there'll be a period of grace for the operators. The soft block will, will remain and the DVSA will be chasing them down. If they are chasing them down, it's about timetables data still, because there's still a lot of work to do there. And that timetables has to come first. Um, so yeah, there will be a hard block and there will be sanction, but I think we're looking at early next year before that really starts to become something more punitive, I think. Um, you see, the problem the problem we've got is we have a circular problem because the data is not good enough. We can't develop the applications and the benefits uh, of having the data and the operators are losing faith and getting annoyed and dragging their feet and doing the minimum because they're not seeing any value out of a large amount of spending that are being forced to do. And the only way out of that situation is to drive enforcement and to do it soon. Otherwise, we might find that, um, you know, we, we we reach some points where operators are just publishing, you know, um, something that's of completely no use as, as a pure compliance act. Yeah, well, so, I think there's, there's, there's two elements to this. Um, you know, the, the validation rules that I've input are really for the suppliers to fix. The operators can't really control the structure of the data the way we're expecting it. So I think, you know, we're seeing that Ticketer and VIX are very close to getting this right. So by, by default, the operators will start to come to plan, not through any action of their own, but because we've been working with the suppliers to sort this out. What that will do is start for us to see where operators are actually creating nonsense because, you know, they've decided I'm going to create a day pass by creating a fair triangle, which has the same price in every cell of the fair triangle, which is obviously just completely wrong. So it'll be those kind of things that come out of this initial bit of validation because everything's been structured the same way. So we can start to run queries on the first data catalog to say, well, where are we seeing um, a day pass that has distance basis evidence, distance evidence, which are the things that represent the cells. And when we start to see those relationships, we'll say, well, that's actually junk data. And we'll start to be able to sort of develop a plan for how to get rid of 
the operators not doing things right in their ticket machine. But at the moment, until until that data is structured the same, we can't really start to interrogate the data and work out where it is. So I understand what people are saying, and I have various ideas about how we're going to so say, well, you can't you can't create a flat fare using a, a distance matrix element because a distance matrix element is specifically designed for fares where the price grades through structures. Those kind of things they'll start to come out from the validator and from Ticketer and Vic starting to provide that data how we expect to see it. Um, so there's a lot of work still to be done um, from that sense. So there's two, two elements to it, yeah. There's the first bit, which is laying the foundations of identifying the people that are not doing what we expect them to do. And then, the, you know, there's a hard block coming and, you know, what's actually, what's kind of junk data rather than data that's not structured properly, if you understand what I'm saying. It's saying nonsensical things, but in the right structure. Um, yeah, Help, helpful answers. Um, it's, it's, it's a long process. It's, it's, it's tough, isn't it, to to plan investments in developing products. Um, you know, we have a fares API, um, but um, we, we're just shooting at a moving target the whole time. Well, um, I, was, I was hoping to use your API again as a little test case at some point because you know you you guys are further ahead than anyone else, and I'm hoping that these new product types that are in everything and the new user types and everything should allow you to always return more accurate things in your API, saying this is definitely for a child and this is definitely. A, you know, it should it should improve hopefully. But. I think I think it is true that if um, the two big upgrades that we're expecting from from Fix and Ticketer do make a difference, that will that will then illustrate who is actually um, not cooperating and put and inputting poor data. So um, yeah, how, how far away do you think that is? Um, in terms of ticket, Ticketer and Vix, well, yeah. the Ticketer one is actually really. I mean, they've. They've essentially finished their dev work. I don't think it's actually pushed out into production yet, but effectively they're ready to go to production. And it's actually the validator that's got a small issue with the composite frames, which is marking half of their things as non-compliant when it is compliant, mainly because I made a typo in the original uh, documentation. Um, but let's not talk about that. Um, so yeah, once that ticket's fixed, then Ben's kind of in charge of the backlog for the pod service, so he needs to decide what, how prioritised it is. I told him we should prioritise it quickly. So as soon as that's done, you know, which should be in the next month, we should see the vast majority of first debts being complained because that's most of it comes from ticket to ultimately the volume really comes from ticket to um, and they've been quite cooperative and they've you know put the work in to sort of make it happen um so so we're almost there uh, thank you i think the 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 interesting thing with fares is that we'll probably get to the point where there's more compliant usable data more quickly than we are seeing with timetables um yes, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> And, um, and operators that aren't aren't getting involved and engaged are beginning to feel the heat. Um, you might have seen recently the first public inquiry purely based on uh, non-compliance with BODs um, and non-submit, well, non-submitting of data and engagement with BODs, um, which was a big step forward. Um, and so, you know, that has got quite a lot of people's attention um and so uh you know it can only you know move more rapidly from here is there any uh, there's clearly there's still no tying together of schedules and fares uh, and so one of the difficulties with um producing an effective api responses is knowing that you've got them from the same time e epoch um any plans on that front to ensure that people publish at the same time or if you change one you also automatically have to change the other Unfortunately, um, as far as I'm aware, from I'm, I'm no lawyer, no uh, legal legal, but um, for it, I think that from a competition angle, that, that operators can't be obliged to, to have long lead times for data publication for fares. So they're essentially always going to be allowed to do it at the last minute, which is a problem. Um, all we can do is, well, you know, once we've got this structure in place um, for all of fares data, we can at least start to do analysis of what services we've got and what fares have we got for each service um, and then try to sort of work out who isn't doing things correctly but remind me does is there any metadata in in the in the the raw fares that tells you which version of their bods schedules it's based yeah, on not at the moment um you know there's uh, how that would be achieved is very difficult i mean if i were being provocative i would say the best way to achieve it is have uh, timetables data in the text as well um, because there is no straightforward way to do that, I don't think. Yeah, that's that, that's my concern. Yeah, I mean, 
Um, you know, the best we can do is basically just say this product is available to passengers between these dates. Um, and then you have to sort of infer what service that, you know, what version of the service that relates to in terms of timetables. Um, you know, but we will be looking at that. I mean, that's part of the second iteration of the validator. But my, you know, my view at the moment is that's going to be very difficult to achieve. Because Netflix isn't really designed to be saying it relates to this version of that data. Uh, but, you know, there may be ways to do it. Um, it needs more investigation. If we can move on to disruption sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, Tim. and um, keep it reasonably short, that will be helpful. Yes, so disruption service. So we built a new a new tool. This is for all local authorities across the country, you know, not just England anywhere who wants it in, in Great Britain. Um it's basically, you know, similar in spirit to I guess the career fairs, but a different audience is aimed at. Um effectively it's going to be allow you to create disruptions, events, whatever in your area, and define the sort of impacts on the public transport network to a certain degree. Um I'll quickly go through it just as a basic thing. So you know, um, organisations will essentially be um, assigned to admin areas in NPTG and NAPTAM. So they will only be able to create data and, you know, affect things in those areas. So, I mean, that allows obviously, you know, perhaps Essex might, you know, cover Thurrock or something like that. It allows, you know, expansion of geographic scope. This is a test service, so don't take anything what, what's on here. Obviously, awesome.org is a silly name that someone's created. Um, what will happen is that there's different user types, user levels. So every area has admins. So that's effectively where we will give over control of the a geographic area to a local authority. And then they can self-serve as um, as the manager of their area. You can just add as many users to create examples as you want in your area at different levels of permissions, lowest level being staff. You know, that's probably aimed at operators. You can add operators in your area, a fairly straightforward process. Um, so really, it's about self-service. It's not about it needs to be centrally managed by DFT. As soon as we talk to an LTM, they say we want to use it. We set them up as the admin in their area. Then we wash our hands a bit. They can manage who, who creates data in their area and all the rest of it. Um, so I'll just quickly go through the sort of disruption creation journey. So I mean, I guess these tabs, self-explanatory. What's live in your area now? What you've got coming in terms of disruptions in your area? And we've got another tab for recently closed as well, in case you need to reactivate things. Um, so we've got um, the initial screen, which is, you know, what's your disruption? Most elements are self-explanatory. Um, summary. I mean, the, the, these, every single one of these fields in this form are directly related to an element in Sirius X. Um, some of them are mandatory, some of them aren't. So, you know, you can put a link in back to your information page if you want. Um, reasons for disruptions. These are enumerations and schema. Um, you know, we can add more if we need. When is the disruption? Again, self-explanatory. Um, publication window, slightly different. This is essentially trying, you know, communicate to the downstream user. When do you want to advertise this disruption? Um, often, I guess, for unplanned disruptions, these will be the same values because you found about it retrospectively and you try to create a disruption for it. But if it's planned and you know long in advance, you may be saying, well, you know, I'm creating this six months ahead of the event or whatever. But I only wanted to be advertised a month before, so you could account for that in the publication window. And we've got various little features here for, um, you know, allowing you to add new periods of disruption and things like that. Um, yeah, so um, that helps that when I've broken it because I tried decided to do the additional thing on the test site. Um, so it's. Um, We are going to look at in the future, actually, um, pulling in the Street Manager API. That's I think next on the roadmap, or certainly the roadmap for July, August time. We will bring in Street Manager data, um, which obviously tells you there's roadworks in your area, and we can essentially prompt users to say these are roadworks in your area. Does there any impact on public transport in your area? And you can create a disruption for it. Um, had a consequence. So I'm rushing through this because I'm short of time, but there's, there's different different levels you can, you can define the impact of the public transport network. So you've got network wide, fairly self-explanatory. That's, you know, this affects buses in my area, it affects trams in my area. That might be snow or whatever. And 
operator wide. So that's very self manager again, you know, um, it affects a certain operator in my area. So, you know, what you should see is um, services that are linked to your area. Obviously, you've seen all kinds of random operators here because I've got multiple areas attached to my account, but a, a, a user regularly would just see all the operators that operate services in their area. So I might say a course liner. Oh, no, no, from course liner on here is because I'm not trying to um, foreshadow anything, but you might say a course liner has C trading or whatever, you know, add a disruption. Room J5 is yes, disruption, very severe, you know. You may want to describe it that way. Various different things you can do. Um, and then we have stops and services. So this is really where we're actually pulling in the network data and the nap time data and put it on a map and allowing people to sort of configure the disruption the way they want to dis disrupt it. I mean, so you know, map here has got a nice little map feature. You can pop it out full screen. There's geographic search, so you can put Ramel uh, Lane, and it'll take it to Ramel Lane Football Stadium, whatever. So there's a geographic element to the search. But there's also stops element to the search. Um, so you can put in Meadow Hall, you know, and it'll come up with all the stops on Meadow Hall. That comes from NAPTAM. So the two ways of searching, you can search related to the transport network, you can search related to geography, or you can actually just go into the map and then start to draw polygons on the map. Um, it will pull up all the stops in the polygon, you can move the polygon around if you want, and just add them as being impacted. So if you're not familiar with the geography of the area, you don't have stop names, you can just draw little shapes on the map. And the sh I've done a four-sided one, but it can be as many sides as you want. And um, it's quite flexible in terms of what you do. Um, so yeah, you might say all these, just, you know, last day, all stops closed. Um, and you say remove from Jenny Fires, yes, you know, whatever the severity is. Um, and then essentially that will uh, in mode. Um, it's obviously not a good idea. Um, so yeah, you know, I've created disruption now with various consequences. You know, I'm saying coastline cease trading, you know, remove all coastline services from your database. I'm also saying remove these stops from match data. Obviously, it's a nonsense disruption, uh, but it gives you an idea of the kind of things you can configure. You can go to service level, you can go to stop level. Um, you can do that using NAPTAN, you can do it using BODS data, you can do your TMDS data. We're going to give users the choice of sourcing their route and timetable data from TMDS or BODS. That's obviously, we need to use TMDS to keep it multimodal. Um, you'll be able to select that um, as you sort of default settings, which mode you want to use, which data source. Um, and then, yeah, there's obviously the other geographic functions that Mapbox supports. So there's quite a lot of functionality there that allows you to define disruption, and then you just publish it. Um, we do have social media coming. That's yet to be de deployed um, because we are having issues with Hootsuite and not sort of not really cooperating with us very well in terms of authorizing our callback URLs and things. So that social media functionality is kind of delayed a bit. Um, we also have disruptions that require approval. So like I said earlier, you might want to add an operator in your area if you're a local authority, but you don't want them to actually publish data. You just want them to create it, and you may want to review it before it goes out. So you know, there's going to be essentially a page where it says, you know, somebody has created a draft of disruption here. There might be an operator in your area, and you can go in uh, and then just um, publish the disruption. And you can approve it. So there's various different levels of users, different levels of functionality. Um, and then just as a, a roundup, we have an API coming at the back end. This is what we could talk about in a second about how people get access to this. Um, it's just a big dumb API at the moment. Gives you all the disruptions that are live and upcoming uh, that's coming out of the service. So that'll be nationwide. Later on, when this is integrated with BODS, there'll be various filtering built in. So you can filter just for your local area. You know, because we've got a lot of local authorities speaking to Greater Manchester, they're going to integrate this data. They're going to use this service to create disruptions in their area and reintegrate it back into their B network offer that they're building. So, you know, they'll be able to filter it just for it disruptions in their area rather than having to get the whole country. So yeah, we've, we've got a lot of plans for how we're going to expand on this API, etc. Um, the data, this data might be a bit small, might be. I don't know how familiar people are with Sirius X. I'm not going to talk through it now, but if you want to ask the API, let me know. We can give you access to the UAT API and I can advise on the, the data coming out. But I think it's quite a good, you know, the service isn't live yet. We don't have, um, we don't have if you look, we don't have a data.gov, a, a, a good.uk domain yet. So until we get that, it's not going live. 
but we've got a lot of plans for it. Um, and it's quite good because it's going to be nationwide and a lot of local authorities are talking about using it and then reintegrating it back into their systems, which of course it creates more more incentive to keep the data valuable and up to date and accurate because obviously it's put power in their own systems. So yeah, it's a whirlwind tour. Um, uh, quite a chaotic tour of the service, but if anybody wants, yeah, has anybody got any questions, I guess, about this? Silence. Um, yeah. I assume people looks, haven't followed. Looks really good. Right, I'll come out that's, that's good. I was going to say, people either haven't followed what I said because I've gone through it so chaotically, or, you know, people are, well, this does what we need it to do. But... Hmm. Yeah, if any day... The nation of England. Is it the nation sorry? of England, nationwide? Uh, GGB wide. Any, anybody, any local authority who wants to use it can use it. Uh, it's got TNDS data in. Um, so you can just do it using TNDS data. That's obviously GB wide. Um, and once there is, you know, a Welsh BODS or a Scottish BODS, we can pull that data into the reference data service underpinning this quite quickly and present their data from their versions of BODS should they want to use it as well. So it's you know, it's easily easily scalable, but yeah, you can you can you can create disruption anywhere in the country at the moment using TNDS data. But yeah, I mean, obviously, we'd like as many people to use it as possible because the more authorities are creating the data, the more people are using it. It's a virtuous circle. You know, it's a bit like the chicken egg you talked about earlier, Jonathan. I guess. Um, yeah, the more people that create the data, the more people will consume the data. Um, so yeah, all I say is. Anybody who wants to look at the disk about the back end, let me know. I can give you access to the test API. Anybody, any local authorities here who are interested in using it as well, get in touch and uh, you know we can onboard you to the service. OK, is there anything Software. else for Stephen, who's done a uh, sterling job uh, covering all of that? Yeah, I've winged it, so don't judge me too harshly. <laughs> OK, if there's nothing else on that, then uh, I will take over and do a brief thing on flexible services. Dan and Fatima. Well, I was just clapping my hands for Stephen doing a good, a good ah, presentation. Oh, right. I just saw a hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll reply to any questions in the chat, Tim. You can press on. Yeah, OK. Services. Cool. Uh, thank you. So, yes. So I will uh, just talk briefly about flexible services. Um, because um, there is an open consultation at the moment. Um, you've had the details on an email at least once. If you're on um, multiple email groups, you will have been bored with the spamming about them. Um, but um, yeah, so we're now looking at how you can get flexible services information into BODs. Um, and um, the the way that BODS works at the moment, the profile uh, only supports fixed route and fixed timetables, uh, and it doesn't cope with um, more flexible uh, approaches as those more flexible approaches become more important in core networks. That becomes more of a problem because if you just use BODS data, then you're not going to see a lot of the country that has some form of public transport provision having any um, and so uh, how do we deal with that um, particularly in the place where there's as many variants of what it's called and ways it operates as there are services out there every service seems to redefine how to run and book and things like that um, but what we're trying to do is cover um, everything from uh, a fully flexible service that will pick people up and drop people off within an area base um, through to um, those sort of services that run normal fixed route, fixed timetable, then go off and do something flexible for a bit um, and then come back to um, 
more traditional operation, either, you know, in the middle or the end or, um, you know, wherever. Um, and so we're trying to cover all of those uh, different types of arrangements. Um, the problem at the moment is that because there isn't an agreed approach, people are trying to get flexible service data into BODS uh, in a number of different ways. Most of them seem to hang around creating some form of sample or notional timetable that enables a route to be described or a you know an area of operation to be described um, and then going um you know, this is this is notional or you know you've got a pre-book in advance and this is the phone number um one of the challenges is that notes are often not presented by downstream uh systems and applications um in part because the bods advice is note shouldn't be used for anything that's meaningful um so there's a bit of a catch-22 there in the in the uh, advice um but fundamentally that's sound um and because there is a concept of a you know there is something that is akin to a timetable journey planners use that um, and therefore don't necessarily give um, a proper reflection of what's available. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to um, come up with a way of supporting bus services that are registerable with the Traffic Commissioner as a flexible service. Um, one of the fallouts from that is because that's so wide ranging, pretty much any form of demand responsive community transport that isn't registrable uh, with the traffic commissioner it also becomes covered um, but I'm not convinced that every form of service out there uh, is supportable but I've not got any evidence that they're not but it makes me nervous um, because there are so many different ways of doing things and modelling it, you know, there, there will be something out there that we can't cope with. Um, so if you've got a particularly different way of running your service uh, or you know of one that's, you know, a bit different or a bit interesting, then let me know and we'll have a look at that and uh, make sure that it's modelable or not. Or, or, you know, actually, sometimes we might not be able to. But the vast majority uh, are going to be modelable. Um, and fundamentally, what we've tried to do is keep the data requirement as simple as possible. Uh, the information that is on a leaflet uh, or a web page pretty much will do. Uh, it's where is it covered? Uh, uh, what stops or what zones if it's an area based thing when it operates you know monday to friday 9 30 till 12 and 2 till 4 something like that and uh, this is the phone number or this is the url for the web page to to book um so sort of very basic information um and for most um operations that's going to be really simple um, uh, if you operate a more complicated arrangement where you've got part fixed and part flexible, then, of course, it becomes slightly more difficult. Um, but fundamentally, the flexible bit, we're trying to keep really simple so that organisations that have got minimal IT and skills uh, can easily uh, provide the information to somebody to code up. Um, there is a different, there is a particular use case which is worth bringing to the attention of this group because from a standards point of view, um, there's a proposal to do something slightly different. So these are on-demand stops, so sometimes called Hotel California, um, where the bus will visit a village uh, only when it's requested by somebody on the bus uh, or pre-arranged. Um, and if it's not pre-arranged, 
then it will just bypass the village and carry on on its normal route, you know, either in the middle or the at the end. There are a number of ways of presenting that that people are doing at the moment. Um, fundamentally, though, um, you come up with the same problem as you do with um, much more flexible arrangements. Journey planners don't quite cope with it properly and things like that. Um, and um, because a lot of these apps that are causing some of the challenges and some of the customer complaints um, are GTFS fed, um, now we've looked at, well, what does GTFS support and how can we improve things? Um, and um, GTFS actually does cope with this much better than uh, Trans Exchange does um, and can cope with uh, coordination with the driver to arrange pick up or drop off, um, something that NATAN doesn't, uh, Trans Exchange doesn't. Um, and um, the other problem is that um, a number of um, data consumers don't honour set down only flags in against individual stops, um, which uh, causes some of the problems. So the the solution, um, because having to create a fully flexible journey pattern for just a stop or two uh, is a bit overkill. Um, what we are proposing is an addition to the trans exchange schema, which we would put into 2.4 and 2.5 uh, to add a pick up driver request and set down driver request uh, enumeration. Um, during the consultation sessions, it has become um, evident that um, we need to add into that enumeration list a pick up and set down at driver request um, because sometimes that's uh, a valid option and this is a one or none um, enumeration um, and then once we've done that then there's a load of education and awareness activity that's going to be needed to get people to uh, understand how to do this um and use this and get it pushed out on gtfs feeds and things like that for um consumers to use um but it seems the most pragmatic approach uh to to solving this hotel california problem that we've got um i don't know whether anybody's got any thoughts on that and comments No. OK, excellent. Um, so um, in sorting out the flexible service problem, of course, there's a number of challenges and risks. Um, the the proposals could be really wrong and could have got the work and the modelling very wrong. Um, so there might need to be some significant rework uh, once you've got your teeth into it and commented. Um, the approach that we're proposing whilst it's within the trans exchange schema and the schema documentation and things like that um very few people are using it at the moment so it's not well supported so there's a big industry adoption piece that's going to be needed uh you know encouraging journey planner suppliers to um work out how to use it within their algorithms for example uh and um uh, app providers and things like that how to how to display it to people um and the other one is that um whilst there are some authorities that have been using naptan to create flexible zones uh, for naptan geeks flx stop types um you know, some parts of the country have got quite a lot lincolnshire uh, is a good example where they've uh, created a lot of these and have, are trying to use them. There's a lot of authorities that have got flexible uh, services where they're not using them. Um, and so um, there's a tool chain issue there because we don't think everybody can create these in some of the tools. Um, but 
again so there's an education piece and um there's conversations going on with the naptan team uh, uh to make sure it aligns with the work that they're doing and the investigations that they're doing um because uh, all of this falls down if if operators try and create their their flexible services and the zones aren't in place and things like that so um you've hopefully seen the uh profile document which is uh an adjunct to the 1.1 1 .1, uh profile at the moment document that will become merged into version 1.2 of the profile or version 2 or whatever the next release is going to be but for the time being it will be you know uh i say standalone but you can't implement flexible bus services in the profile without referring a lot to the uh, rest of the profile because it you know the the structures borrow an awful lot from uh, from the main profile but hopefully it provides suppliers and consumers with what you need to be able to produce and consume data if it doesn't that's one of the things that I desperately need you to shout out and tell me about um, so that we can sort it out. Um, in terms of time scales, um, we're going through the consultation. Um, there's been a couple of webinars, one last week and one earlier this week. The recordings are available um, and the slide decks from that, which are much bigger than what I'm presenting today. Um, by the end of next week i'm hoping people have um got some feedback and getting that back to me i'm getting stuff in already um from people then we'll go through a, a revision process um for you know following on from that feedback um and uh, if it's not too great then we'll get out a final version by the end of the month um for final consultation and then release it during july if it's more fundamental and we've got it badly wrong then you know that'll take a bit longer to to sort out and we'll go through the the, the review process again to make sure we do get it right um that's that cycle of uh, of standards that's uh, that's inevitable um so um the ptic website has got a page with all of the um, profile documents on slide decks, links to recordings and things like that to find out more. Um, and um, there is a special consultation email address. Try and use that rather than one of the nor my normal ones um, because I'm trying to separate it out so that these, the feedback doesn't get lost um, in the myriad of emails that I get. So uh, has anybody got any questions, thoughts, comments on flexible services and the process? No. OK. In which case, um, we will move on to um hear from um mark on what wales are doing with their version of bods thank you uh pananda um i'm just going to share my screen let me know when you can see it yep cool thank you right um so I thought we'd do a overview via the power of a uh, diagram and uh, something completely similar to what's been discussed so far, I think. Um, let's talk about the Welsh Bus Data Service. So this is a piece of procurement that occurred probably in the last um, 12 months. Uh, I think the contracts were awarded in the last six months. Um, and Welsh Bus data service is made up of two lots. We have one lot that's been won by VIX and a second lot by Journeo. And I'm just going to talk you through what we are proposing, what we're going to be using the solutions for, and um, some of the standards that we will adopt from PTIC and RTIG as well. 
So Welsh Bus Data Service is all around the collation of bus data that um, really is quite sporadic uh, around Wales. It's very similar to a pre-BODS world in England, um, and it's trying to centralise the data sets, both active data sets that are part of the current operation within Wales, but also as we look towards franchising, how we um, catalog and use data within the organization uh, as we look towards the redevelopment of the franchise network. So we are adopting the BOD standards in terms of the real-time timetable and fares data and we'll continue to watch and influence hopefully any changes along those. Um, we're also interested in flexible services. We run a number of uh, flexible areas throughout Wales uh, and are taking part of the consultation for that. Uh, one of the differences I think within Wales really is around commercial data within our agreements with operators currently we do have a or access to ticket machine data and that uh, needs to be catalogued stored for downstream analysis as well so the WBDS solution includes uh, commercial uh, data sets as well. When we talk about other data, we're talking around uh, things like coach data set, rail data sets, as we work towards a multimodal world within TFW. And also within there, we've got NAPTAN. So within WBDS, we have a NAPTAN editor to ensure that the stops are updated and maintained. Um, historically in Wales, they haven't been well maintained, maybe <laughs> across the UK, that's true as well. And what we're trying to do here is work with local authorities very closely. We have a, a person within the team who are looking, is looking at NAPTAN. Um, it has an impact on some of the tap on, tap off work that we're doing and stop accuracy, um, both in terms of its location and, na and naming is very important to us, in particular Welsh language support as well. So working with local authorities and the DFT to improve the data quality. And as you can see, the data from here falls into a predictions engine, which is part of the VIX solution. So that enables us to provide a national data set for predictions, um, which has an outbound API to num numerous data consumers, both internal to TFW, um, systems that we are procuring or have procured for franchising and the analysis of the network, but also into a content management system, which was lot two. Uh, just go back to the start of the process, um, you'd be aware that Traveline Cymru was a, an entity that is now moved across into TFW and they produce the majority of data for the Welsh data sets um, in terms of timetables. The larger operators, top six operators, have got scheduling tools and provide their own schedules via Trans Exchange, but the majority, um, as you find in BODS, uh, with the English operators don't have the tools, skills or time to produce timetable data and we do produce their data on their behalf. So coming into Welsh Bus Data Service is a key focus for us as we always talk about data quality, what does that actually mean? Is It's really working closely with the local authorities and the operators ensuring that that timetable data is spot on as we drive it through into the predictions engine. Um, our world is slightly simple in terms of real-time data and providers. We've got Stagecoach who use the VIX ticket machines and in the rest of Wales, uh, we've ha we have Ticketer. So essentially we've got two suppliers providing data into this service. Um, moving through into the, well, into the content management system, this was one by Journeo. And what we've done here is work with the Arctic standard in providing a national content management system, which can then drive um, display supplier agnostic um, displays to uh, the local authorities of Wales. So local authorities will procure their displays and uh, via a SAM framework, and those displays will connect into the CMS. So it ensures that we've got one CMS um, which allows us to do things like having a national standard potentially on how these displays look and feel. At the moment, they're, they're quite different. The user experience is quite different throughout Wales. If we can work with local authorities and come up with a standard. Um, it also has some cost savings for the local authorities in having one CMS and being able to um, 
work with different suppliers for different situations, different requirements that they have. Um, so we're working closely with the Arctic group on that. Uh, we heard earlier about Stephen talking about disruptions. So that, that's really key, obviously, within the predictions world. So um, the CMS does have a um, disruptions tool built into it. I think a lot of the specification for this was done pre, well, quite a while ago, at least 12 months ago, pre DFT, uh, working on these new tools. And uh, But we have a um, disruptions tool within the CMS. We're also going to work closely with um, the ticket machine providers to provide the Sirius X cancellation data as well going into the predictions engine. So we get a real good quality uh, information uh, around cancellations. Uh, we recognise in Wales there's quite a lot of displays out there that only display uh, current timetable information, not even real time. So we want to ensure that we do get um, good quality um, predictions data into these displays. Uh, in terms of timescales, we have so the project started in quarter one in April and we're mobilizing with our two suppliers now. We they've currently stood up the systems and go through a migration phase. Um, and then sort of summertime this year, we're going to be looking at integrating the data sets, working closely with Cardiff Council, who have recently procured 170 new displays in Cardiff. We'll test that. Uh, and then into next year, we'll then start to work with other local authorities with their procurement, working with Welsh Government funding for new displays and uh, solutions that they have. Um, going into 24, really, then to um, have more data sets available. Um, I'm hoping early part of next year, we'll start to see all of Wales covered um, and having real time data, uh, particularly for. Um, downstream users trying to see how we can integrate this within a TFW app as well. So where local authorities haven't procured displays, can we display real time information to them by our own app uh, and user experience? Uh, I think that's my update. Um, anybody got any questions or thoughts? going to be interesting i think to see how those people that provide services cross border um can use uh data from uh from the tfw setup as well as the english bods and combine the two so i think that's going to be a you know an interesting challenge for the first people to who, who do that yeah, I think we've got around nine services of English operators that cross the boundary into Wales. Um, majority of our services, I think, are Welsh operators going into England, but we will have to source data from BODs for those English operators. Right. Can I ask, um, you, you mentioned multimodal. Um, is that fully multimodal, that model that you've just walked through, or is that is that bus? That was bus and multimodal in the sense of for the real time displays to understand if we can um, insert maybe coach uh, arrivals into the real time displays, but also maybe um, when we look at the Trouse network and connectivity into the rail network, how we can integrate rail transfers across as well. Any other questions, comments for Mark? No, thank you very much, Mark. That was very useful. Um, I'm going to skip over journey planner performance because I don't think there's anything particularly to um, report from that work, um, which then brings us to an update from Travel Line. Um, and oh, we got Mike, yes. Hello, Mike. Hey, yeah. Thanks, Tim. Uh, oh, just a quick few things to bring up to speed on. First of all, um, around TNDS, uh, we've just introduced an uh, automatic sign up for TNDS now for any open data users. Uh, the previous process involved someone filling an online form. We would then have to go and create usernames, passwords, and then email them back manually, which could take up to two or three days. So we've now 
uh, literally within the last week or so, introduced where users are presented instantly with access to the data set. So that's hopefully improved access for those. Uh, we're making a number of back office changes as well in the, the various formats of data that we receive from regions. Uh, we've got a number of regions, particularly in the North East and Northwest, wanting to provide a uh, new Trans Exchange or Trans Exchange 2.4 now, uh, moving from SIF. So we're making some changes so we can kind of accept that data and also feed that through to TNDS. Uh, we're also in the midst of um, re re renewing the hosting arrangements for TNDS. Uh, current re situation is kind of coming to an end, so we're, we're kind of working with our suppliers on that. And then the final area in this uh, piece was we're working with, or we've been working over the last kind of three to six months with NHS England um, on a trial and embedding the Traveline uh, widget into various trust websites. Uh, with a view to the, rolling that out across the piece. So we're currently working with trusts in Cambridge, Wigan and West Birmingham. And we'll be tracking the usage of those so we can work out some kind of model that how we may roll that out wider uh, across the piece. Uh, so that's particularly helping them work on their net zero carbon uh, agenda. Uh, with regard to Plus Bus, um, we are currently in UAT where, with the e-ticketing. Um, so we have been working with Silver Rail. We've actually created a QR code now. It is it is possible using the RDG schema. Uh, we've created that. We're working with bus operators and their ticket machine providers on actually validating those tickets uh, on bus. So like I said, we're currently hoping to hear from Ticketer in the next week. So once we get the outcome uh, of that UAT, uh, we should then be able to give clearer timescales of when we'd roll out uh, with that. We're hoping that once we get the green light, we'll roll out UK wide or right across the piece, uh, making those available. So it's a real big step change um, in the offer there with that. I think the thing that's always let Plus Plus down is the fact that you once you buy your ticket, you then got to go to a station to collect it. So we naturally see the majority of sales on the destination leg. Uh, so we're hoping that we see a huge increase on the kind of the origin uh, of journeys and should make that a lot easier. Uh, we've also, we during the UAT, we're ta already talking to retailers and we are talking to the likes of Trainline who are really keen to get going uh, immediately with this. So Trainline have been one of the no notable uh, non-retailers in the recent past. So hopefully once we get the e-ticket launch, we should see a lot more people using it and that integration between rail and bus uh, improving. Um, alongside that, we're also working with suppliers on the uh, improvement of the interactive plus plus mapping uh, on the website. That's particularly the creation of zones, uh, collection of data from the NAPTAN stops in there. And we'll be making that data available openly um, as well. We're working with RDG of making all plus plus data uh, available on RDM. So they're just waiting. They're, they're in the final throes of their development of, of making flat files available. And we'll, plus plus will be the first data that will be provided uh, on the RDM platform uh, in the flat file uh, system. And then alongside that, we're also working on development uh, that's underway now, which will allow third parties to update their uh, plus plus zones, uh, fares all into one system which again will be an automated process to update the website. So work on that has started. The, the system we inherited was very manually intensive in that we email 280 local scheme coordinators, ask them when they want to change the fares at various times of the year. We then receive emails back. There's a copy and paste in the various spreadsheets and updating multiple systems. So hopefully now we'll be able to give them the keys. They can go in the back end, amend their zones uh, to, to match whatever they want it to be. And also they can amend the fares in there and it should hopefully help automate certain certain elements of those processes. So a lot of work underway in the background and uh, we're making some good progress. So hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have a, a lot more to update on that. And fingers crossed, we'll actually be able to have a live uh, plus plus e-ticket uh, as well that's out there. So we'll keep you posted. But other than that, Tim, back to you for any questions. Thanks, Mike. That sounds like significant progress. Uh, it's it's taken taken a while to to see plus bus actually start to potentially play a major part in uh, in modal shift so yeah looking forward to it yeah no wait, the ticket's real it's just needs validating now and, and they know what they're doing we're told to validate that ticket so fingers crossed yeah but we'll have more positive news uh, next meeting soon mm. any plans for any more um um segments to approach with your widget um, obviously there are lots of other public services where you could have a widget um, if you were going to enter into that kind of role yeah absolutely absolutely Jonathan. i think where, where, where we're starting with it we we with known contacts at the nhs it was kind of an easy way in so i think we're, we're running this one as a bit of a trial that the widget has been available and there's a commercial offer for the widget um for any third party integration 
Um, but the NHS seemed a good place to start. So I think yeah, once we do this trial, we'll work out what what you know kind of what's possible in rolling this out. And I think you're right. Then it'll be a case of identifying other areas. So it, it hasn't been straightforward uh, in that. Like so we've had an offer there for for many years, but we we're kind of revitalising that. I think or re-energising it a little bit as well. So yeah, absolutely, we'd we'd be keen to roll out as, as wide as we could. Just interested because um, traditionally Travel Line has been like a head aggregator, and other people lower down the hierarchy had built things directly for end users. Um, if Traveline is moving into a different role, um, I think that's probably of wider interest for people to um, to understand. If, let's say, John, early days on this one at the minute, it was just, we were approached by uh, the NHS to see what we could do. And then this was just one of the things that, you know, obviously is available. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted on any progress with this and any intentions to go further with it. Uh, Paul. Yeah, hi, Tim, thanks. Um, I was just going to say to Mike, we, we did a project up in Scotland a few years back where we actually, so we, we did embed um, widgets into the NHS sites, but one thing that was even more effective was to essentially mail merge journey results into people's appointment letters. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, you, you have an appointment at 10 o'clock, you can catch the number 27 bus, it gets you there, you know, ahead of time sort of thing. That That was found to be the most effective uh driver of modal shift yeah no exactly paul yeah it's i think we've we've kind of met with them kind of right in the early part of this year and there's plans mm -hmm. afoot to do all kinds of stuff you know that we did actually you know journey plans are produced like it says part of the appointment letters and yeah exactly. and links out i think we've spent the last three months trying to get a widget on the website so i think yeah that's the next <laughs> stage i think and, you know there's a load of quick wins in there i think it was just we 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 thought the integration would be a lot easier uh than it's actually been but um we are getting there and yeah there's there's, there's plans afoot for yeah, including yeah. appointment letters and that kind of thing. Yeah, to point people at it. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yep, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the voice of experience there with that. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any more for Travel Line? No. Okay. Um, EU standards so uh i'd circulated um a a note um on this so um most of the european standards out there for public transport um and that includes um the uk standards like naptan and trans exchange are based around something called trans model which is an overall high fluffy architecture for public transport um, and all of the myriad of different bits of data that are necessary. Um, fundamentally, if you look at you know, public transport operation, you do some planning of what you're going to do for vehicles and staff and um, bus stops and things like that. Well, that's quite well defined in NetEx. Um, Trans Exchange and NAPTAN were predecessors to, to that. Um, then you've got what's happening on the day, the live sort of stuff, which is dealt with by Siri. Um, and then you've got the what happened and, you know, how does that affect um, what I might need to plan and to do tomorrow and things like that, that historical and that performance um, view of the world hasn't been um, really looked at within a trans model um, environment. And there isn't a, a standard for moving that data around uh, a good number of years ago um, now. Um, the work was done in 2017 and in traditional standards format, standards world, it wasn't published until 2019 once it had been through all its approvals processes and things like that. So, you know, six years ago, people started to think about, well, actually, we need to have a standard to move the historical and the performance related data around. Um, and uh, a catchy name was came up with. Uh, Operating raw data and statistics exchange, uh, Opera, um, is probably a uh, <laughs> more memorable um, approach. So a project was defined 
um, and has sat for a long time with the European Commission and SEN to uh, actually get agreement to move forward um, with it. Well, the good news is, is that um, approval has been given to move forward with OPERA um, and project teams are um, getting together to put bids together to send um, and uh, the European Commission to move that forward. Um, I'm expecting that work will actually start on this in September. There's a number of people that when I first started saying back in 2020, uh, who's interested in this? Um, because when it kicks off, we'll need to think about use cases, get people together to look at some of the early outputs of uh, XML and things like that to see whether it works for the way that you work and think within your tooling sets and things like that. Um, we're now at the point where, you know, come the autumn, work will be starting on this. Um, and so um, if anybody thinks that they might have an interest in this work, that's more than just knowing that it's going on and, um, you know, at a very high level, then please do let me know uh, uh, because uh, Artig is involved in that and I'm involved in that as well. Um, so um, I can uh, either help you get involved or, you know, we'll do some use case development within the UK um, to help feed into Europe, that sort of thing. And we can do things, uh, you know, more within a, a UK context. Um, so um, don't expect quick results. This is a European bit of work. Um, it's a standards bit of work, so it's going to take a while. Um, my guess is it will be 12 months, maybe 18 before we get, well, 12 months before there's a schema that people can start to play around with in anger that, isn't going to chop and change too much um, and probably 18 months, maybe longer before there's a send badge on it and it's um, an agreed standard, um, which is quite quick going for a standard, um, but because it will be uh, technically a, a, a TR rather than a, a, an EN, um, you know, um was well, got to start with you you have to start there before you can get to uh the en type standard which is something that you can put into um legislation and go i require you to uh, uh follow this to the letter um and uh, and you're in breach of the law if you don't so you know you you you've got to prove that it's that it's viable first so you start with the with the the easier simpler um, voting an agreement approach. So, yeah, if you want to get involved in the development of OPERA, um, please do let me know. There's a couple of organisations that have expressed interest a few years ago. Hopefully they've not lost interest, um, but uh, I know at least one of them hasn't. Um, so, uh, so there will be some uh, supplier involvement. So any questions on OPERA? Anybody want to say, yes, please, do we want to get involved? No, as normal, everybody. You hear the, the running feet out the door at the first sign of, oh, do you want to get involved in standards development? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Um, on vehicle standards, there's some new work starting um, on that, particularly around supporting um, electronic vehicle data and access to live vehicle data such as acceleration and braking and whether indicators are flashing and things like that, um, which will be uh, quite exciting if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and um, perhaps more relevant for this group is, is an update to the Open Journey Planner standards so ogp has been around for a couple of years um 
I don't think anybody in the UK is using it. Um, use OJP in Dublin. Oh, excellent. Excellent. It's awful. It's awful. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> well, I'm not volunteering by the way. Even the OJP project team recognise it's awful, um, <laughs> which, is, which is why they're not going to do a 1.2. They're going, we're going to do some breaking stuff to try and make this better. Um, and so um, work Happy is to provide feedback on OJP if you need some. Uh, yeah, we, we we need some conversations, Paul, All right. <laughs> um, because we're heading to version two. Um, I'm, not the, I'm, not, I'm not the new Nick Knowles, though, right? Let's just be clear. <laughs> yeah. No, well, Nick is still remarkably heavily involved in, in European stuff and his name crops up all the time. It's amazing. I can, I can give you some feedback on OJP. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be good. That'll be good. Um, so, yeah, so we're heading towards a version uh, two for OJP, which hopefully fixes a lot of the difficulties um, that exist at the moment um, with better integration with some of the other um, SEND standards. So, yeah, I'll have a conversation with Paul. If anybody else is interested, then uh, let me know and... Um, I can act as the middleman or you can become directly involved in that. Um, it's up to you. Um, and um, they're also looking at how we might use uh, JSON and various other uh, approaches rather than just uh, using uh, XML. So uh, that's the new stuff going on internationally. Has anybody got any questions on standards and european stuff no okay um issues log um there's nothing new on the issues log um once the flexible service stuff um consultation has um closed um, I will write an issue change request for Trans Exchange to cover the activity uh, for bus stops to um, include the pick up and set down on driver request thing um, because uh, that's the formal way of um, going through a change process for Trans Exchange. So I'll do that. And I'll circulate it round, and we can have the we can go through the um, the the formal process of uh, that change. Um, if anybody ever comes across a problem or thinks this is wrong, or we could do it differently on any standard, then um, please feel free to use the um, issues log change log process. Um, the forms are on the PTIC website. Um, and we can formalise updates off the back of it. Um, so that then gets us to um, the next meeting. Oh, bef bef before we get on to the next meeting, um, there's something that um, I've got uh, a... Uh, few slides on something called the bus center of excellence um which might ring a few bells in people's minds so um if you can remember what was said in bus back better um there was a statement in it that said the new bus center of excellence will help drive the country's bus sector recovery uh, very bold brash statements um uh but to uh to to achieve that the department of transport have actually set up um a um bus center of excellence now um in conjunction with CIHT um who've got a long track record of working with the industry 
um, and um, as I say, that's set up. Um, and it's got a mission statement um, about supporting bus professionals and training them um, and helping people understand uh, more about the bus industry, how to work in it and developing uh, the skill sets uh, of people working in the industry. Um, and um, as I say, it's run by CIHT um, and it's uh, going to coordinate the pulling together of material um, from uh, partner organisations um, and that includes Artig, um, Bus Users UK, um, DFT, CPT, there's lots of people involved um, in it. Um, it's developing um, training material and events and things like that and pulling together um, those so that rather than people having to go to myriad different places to find out what's going on and find material out. Um, so hopefully it's going to be really quite useful. Um, the big new thing really um, is a um, certificate um, and training program that um, is being developed and introduced um, but and that's being run by CILT not CIHT so the two are working together the two acronyms are working together um, to, uh, to, to develop um, practitioner certificates to help develop the skills within local authorities and operators uh and provide some form of you know certification and and an understanding as people move around between organizations that they've got some relevant skills that are transferable um rather than just experience you know you can have a certificate and hopefully that will help people develop um that will be launched in the autumn um but the big the the reason for including this here is uh earlier on in the week um the bus center of excellence website was launched um it's quite a useful resource of content already if you're thinking about modeling planning bus networks um investment programs and business cases and things like that um and it's pulling together information and content from a number of organizations already. Um, so it's worth bobbing onto that um, and seeing what it's up to. Um, it's already got more content on it and developed than it did a week ago pre-launch. Um, and so uh, it's, it is worth registering for email updates and things like that. Um, but as that develops and Bus Centre of Excellence does more um i'll keep you informed um here because uh it looks as though it's going to be quite useful for the industry um has anybody got any questions about bus center of excellence no okay uh in which case um how do i stop that oh, there we go stop presenting um the button had moved from half an hour ago i'm sure but anyway <laughs> um so um that brings us to um next meeting um that's in the diary for the 28th of september um now we had to move today uh, had to move the meeting that we're in now from yesterday um, because of um, a BODS event that was taking place that a number of us were involved in, um, which um, actually was a really useful um, event looking at um, the future of BODS 
um, and what it might do um, and how it might develop and um, what we can do to um, encourage more adoption and more data and better data quality and things like that. Um, there will be some stuff coming out from it um, that we will share once we've got it. Um, but um, because that was happening yesterday, it triggered a move to a Friday. Um, I've had mixed views about that. Some people have said um, it's a really good afternoon to have a have a meeting like this because there's less diary clashes and things like that. And I've also had, what on earth are you doing holding something on a Friday? You'll not get anybody turning up. Um, so I don't know whether Fridays are viable or not, or whether, you know, Thursdays, which seems to have been when we've had things for quite a while are, are good. So I don't know whether there's any views on whether a change is good from Thursday and whether we need to rethink the 28th or... No? OK. Friday's good for me. I don't Friday's agree. good for me too, I've got to say. It's a lot easier for me to attend. Mm -hmm. OK. So perhaps we will try uh, well, perhaps we'll uh, we'll shift it and um, try the uh, try the twenty ninth rather than the twenty eighth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do that, um, and uh, I will um, update the RDM who I've invited to come um, and give us an update then on what they've been up to in the last year since uh, they last um, let us know that they were launching the uh, the rail data marketplace. Um, so hopefully a year on, um, there will be some plus bus data on it by the sounds of it um, and some other useful things that they can share with us. OK, um, is there any other business? No. OK. In which case, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Have a good rest of the day and a good weekend um, yeah. and enjoy the, the hot weather. <laughs>